But nonetheless, we're glad to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. We're glad to be able to give God praise. Amen. Sister Hood, I like what you said. You said it's March. And we done marched on in here. That's all right. She said it's March and we done marched on in here. And you know, I like that because that's encouraging. I like that because that means no matter what you've experienced in life, no matter what you've gone through through the week, you can march on into the house of the Lord today. She said you might have been laying in your bedroom last Sunday watching this on the screen, but on today you could come into the house of the Lord. Amen. So I'm glad and you should be glad when the text says I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. It has completely different meaning when you've been at home. It has completely different meaning when you've not been able to enter the house of the Lord. But in you, when you're in here, you can feel the presence. When you're in here, you can call on his name and know that not only have you called on his name, but people that have come before you have called on his name. That's the name grandma's called on, granddaddy's called on, sisters, aunties, and uncles have called on, and the thousands of people before you have believed in. Isn't it good to call on the name of the Lord? Amen. 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 I'm so glad. Uh, to be up here and to have seen our praise team. Somebody give our praise team a round of applause. Y'all, they came up here Saturday. They practiced yesterday. Right here, they practiced yesterday with Rylan, and Rylan got them together and worked with them, and Rylan, uh, bless your brother, I know you're at, at Ray of Hope right now leading worship, um, but I thank him so much as well for working with our praise team also. And for today, we also have Mr. Brown. Give Mr. Brown and his son, Ethan, a round of applause as well. They came in earlier before service, and they got together, and they worked it out, and they sounded wonderful, didn't they? Now, it's one thing to have Rylan up there praising God and singing, but it's another thing when we have our own people, amen? So I'm going to use this as a shameless plug. You, too, can sing. You too can have the opportunity to join our praise team as we become, as we get ready to come back and as we move out of this pandemic, we're going to need more people to join our praise team, amen. We're going to need more people to be a part of this move and this mighty work of God. So we are excited about that, amen. And so we are so excited to see what God will do because we've already witnessed what God has done. Also, we had Jenny. Where's Jenny? probably change it that's that's who was dancing I want to thank Jenny you know Jenny drove all the way from Florida to do that praise dance you know and so we're thankful for her ministry we're thankful for that you know some people won't get out of bed and drive down the street to come to the church hello but she drove from she drove from Florida considering the gas prices she drove from Florida and said the least I could do for God is do a praise dance for him. Amen. So we're thankful for that. We're thankful for Jenny. We're thankful for all the people that made this happen. Sister Goodlett, I see you out in the audience. Sister Goodlett is, is, is our media director. Most times she's in the back, but she's trained so many people to be able to do the job without her. Amen. So I'm thankful for that. And now she can sit in the audience. Amen. And, and, and the reason why I bring that up is because sometimes we have people in position so long, they don't even get to go to church themselves because they, they're so hard working in the church. Amen. And sometimes it's just good to be able to be in the pew and hear the word yourself and not try to hear it while doing other things of service. Amen. So that's something we're going to look forward to doing in the new year, making sure all of our leaders, all of our worshipers, people even out in the parking lot ministry, get an opportunity to rotate in and hear the word of God. Amen. Right, right. The word says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Amen? Amen. So here we go. We have a word from the Lord on this Sunday. We have a word from the Lord. And I just want to remind each and every one of you, we're in the season of Lent. The season of Lent started on Wednesday, which was Ash Wednesday. We had a whole lesson on that. And it will end on Resurrection Sunday. Amen? So that's 40 days, right? And we have a calendar which we put out. If you would like that calendar, you can see Sister Mathis after service, and she'll make sure that you get that calendar in which we read Scripture through the uh, Gospel of Luke all throughout the season of Lent so that you can meditate on those Scriptures. Uh, on today, we would be meditating on Luke 5. Amen. However, I'll be preaching from Luke 8. Okay. 
But nonetheless, that's something that we can use in our season of Lent as a meditative platform in which we can pray and have a guided scripture reading uh, as we go through the text. Amen. Nonetheless, like I said, I'll be reading from Luke chapter 8, starting at verse 43. And I'm going to read on down to verse 48. When you get there, say amen. amen. And if you'd like, please stand for the reading of the word of God. And you know, when I read scripture, I like to, to do a responsive reading. So I'm going to ask a couple of questions and say a couple of things, and you know, so we can have active reading taking place so we can remember what the word says. Amen? Amen. The gospel of Luke is the third gospel if you're still looking for it. You got Matthew, Mark, Luke, then John. Amen. Amen. It's in the New Testament. If you're in the Old Testament, you've gone the wrong way. It's, it's in the New. Amen. And so we're in the gospel of Luke chapter 8 starting at verse 30, 43. It says, and a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding. Uh, Who was there? A woman woman was there, and she had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. How many years? Twelve. Twelve, but no one could heal her. Who could heal her? No one. Oh, my goodness. She came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak. She came up behind who? Who you think him is? Jesus, she came up behind him and touched the hem of what? His cloak. And immediately her bleeding stopped. It did what? Wow, that means he's a healer. Who touched me? Somebody say, who touched me? Who touched me? me? Jesus said. When they all denied it, Peter said, Master, the people are crowding and pressing against you. They said, the people are what? crowding and pressing against him. It said, but Jesus said, somebody touched me. He says, he says, he says I, 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 I know people are crowding around me. I, I know other people are touching me, but somebody done touched me. He said, I know the power that has gone out from me. Somebody's touched me. Then the woman seeing that she could not go unnoticed came trembling. And fell at his feet. She did what at his feet? Fell. fell at his feet. In the presence of all the people, she told why she had touched him and how she had been instantly healed. How she had been what? Instantly. Keep that instantly in there. She had been instantly healed. Then he said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. He said, your what? Faith. I'm sorry. Come again and say what? Your your faith? Faith. Your faith has healed you. And then he says, go in peace. Go in what? Peace. Peace. You may be seated in the presence of God. May the Lord add a blessing to the hearing and to the reading of this word. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your healing power. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the ability that you've given your son Jesus Christ to to, to let us know whether it was 2,000 years ago or today that we can go in peace. But Lord, first we have to seek peace. First we have to be ambitious and strive for peace and strive to touch you. But Lord, we know that as we seek you, you are always seeking us. And I pray that in this ministry moment, you would allow the words that you put in my mouth and the meditations that you put on my heart through study and reading this text to convict somebody in the sanctuary or on the other side of the screen to have a better and deeper connection to you. Lord, we thank you for what you have done. We thank you for what you are doing and we thank you for what you will do. In your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Brothers and sisters, I'm... So excited because I got something to tell you. I got something to tell you. You know, when I start preaching and when I be writing this, these sermons, I get excited because it's like I, 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 I've been waiting all week to tell you about how good God is. You know, the gospel means good news and, and, and Luke is a gospel, so that means there's some good news I got to tell you, amen? But what I want to start off with telling you is letting you know that we all need help. I want to say that again. We need help because you can't do it by yourself. 
I don't know if y'all heard me. Maybe y'all didn't hear that at home. I want to say it one more time. I said, we need help. And you can't do it by yourself. You see, brothers and sisters, if you don't remember anything else from this sermon, I need you to understand it's okay to seek God and seek help. I said it's okay to seek God and seek help. That's why I wore my shirt today. Y'all see that? It says, it is okay to have Jesus in therapy too. Y'all see that? I wore my shirt today. I wanted somebody to get this message today. I wore it especially for this Sunday. It's okay. Here we go. It's not okay to seek help. And to seek help from God but disregard help. Let me say that again. I don't want us to miss this. It's not okay to seek help and disregard God. It's not okay to seek God and then disregard help. Hmm? Brothers and sisters, it's okay to admit when you need help. It's okay to go and see a doctor. It's okay to go seek counseling and therapy. It's okay to go talk to somebody. Amen? Amen. I don't know where that stigma has come from. I don't need help. I'm good. I'm fine. No, 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 no. You need to pray and you need to seek help. Brothers and sisters, it's not okay to lie to yourself and to pretend everything okay when it isn't. You shouldn't be laughing when you're not tickled. You shouldn't be scratching when you're not itching. You shouldn't be smiling when you're not pleased. Brothers and sisters, it's not okay to lie and pretend like everything is okay when it isn't. The Bible says you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. Remember I preached on that. Remember I told you the difference between set and make. Set means you're going to run back into that trap. Made means you have a renewed mind, so you'll do something different, so you won't even want to go back. Right? So therefore, if we're honest with ourselves, therefore, if we're truthful with ourselves, we need help. Because we can't do it by ourselves. Brothers and sisters, it's March. And March in New Morning Light Baptist Church symbolizes health and wellness month. Amen? This is the month that the mother's spearhead. And brothers and sisters... I thought it would be only appropriate if we acknowledge healing in the text. If we acknowledge the fact that there is an issue in our community where we have a a, a negative connotation. Meaning we have negative thoughts about health and wellness. We'll do everything we need to do not to go to the doctor. We'll we'll come up with all kind of excuses not to get the help we need. And we'll just blame it on on the fact that, oh, you know, I'm I'm just getting older. Oh, that's just something I'm just not going to pay attention to. Or we'll just say, I'll pray about it and it'll be good. But brothers and sisters, it's okay to admit when you're not okay. You see, something I want us to pay attention to is not only our physical health, but there's something that's equally important. And that's your emotional health. Did you know your emotional health impacts your decisions? Impacts your behavior? Impacts your interactions with people? Impacts how you receive love? Impacts how you give love? It impacts every aspect of your life. And if you only pay attention to your physical health and not your emotional health, you're doing yourself A disservice. You're doing yourself harm. Sometimes we look at people and we don't know why they have the attitude they have. We don't know why they respond the way they respond. And sometimes we take it personal and act as though it's meant really meant toward us. But realistically, it's something that they haven't dealt with in their past. And realistically, you're dealing with the the, the blunt end of all the trauma they may have experienced as a child, as an adult. And this is the representative. This is the shield that they put up to protect themselves. And it's not even about you. But when you haven't done an emotional health check, guess what? That shield that keeps out hurt and pain also blocks love, happiness. 
Brothers and sisters, we need help. And we can't do it by ourselves. You see, I, I found out through reading one of my old psychology books that sometimes we can find ourselves in three stages of emotional health. There are these three stages, and, and if you want, you can write this down. This is going to be a good self-check to, 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 to ask yourself from time to time. These three, three stages are sometimes we can be on the mountaintop. Sometimes we can be in the valley. And other times we can be in the cave. And a lot of times our emotions fluctuate from the mountaintop to the valley, to the cave. Now, realistically, we're in the valley. That means most days are average. Most days we just go on about our lives and nothing's too extravagant, nothing's too different. But when we get to the valley, that's when we're extremely happy. That's when it's better than just an average day. It's a great day. But when we get into the cave, that's when it's a hard time. It's a dark time. That's where depression sets in. Now, the interesting part about this is if you're on the mountaintop too much, you're not being realistic with what's going on in life. If you're always on the mountain, you, you, you're disconnected from the realities of the world, right, right, right? People start thinking something's wrong with you. Every day ain't sunshine and rainbows, hey, amen, right, right? But if you're in the cave too much, it leads to depression. If you're in the cave too much, you're always negative. If you're in the cave too much, you'll find yourself spiraling down. So, brothers and sisters, it's, it's decent to, to have an even balance of, of going from the valley to the mountains and sometimes to the cave because acknowledging your mountaintops acknowledges your blessings, acknowledges the good things that God has done for you. Being in the cave helps you acknowledge the reality and the severity of what you've dealt with, but you don't need to stay in the cave too long. You don't need to stay on the mountaintop too long. When we stay in the cave longer than we're in the mountain, than we're in the valley, guess what? It's depression. Guess what? It's harmful. Guess what? It's bad. So brothers and sisters, as a personal exercise, I don't want you to turn to your neighbor. Don't, 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 don't ask somebody on your row or, or, or at home, wherever you are. Ask yourself, how are you doing today? It's okay. Just say it out loud real quick. How are you doing today? How am I doing today? You know, you, you need to ask yourself, am I in a mountaintop? Am I on the mountaintop? Am I in the valley? Or am I in the cave today? And I challenge you to ask yourself that in the morning when you wake up and you look in the mirror, am I on the mountaintop? Am I in the valley? Or am I in the cave? When it gets to lunchtime, you got to wash your hands back in that mirror. Am I in the mountaintop? Am I on the mountaintop? Am I in the valley or am I in the cave? At dinner time, you need to do a self-check, brothers and sisters. Because oftentimes we go all day, go weeks without even doing a self-check to see how we're doing. When I was in seminary, there was a girl from Germany that came to America and she was taking a class. And she said one thing she liked about the South, which was a good kind of bad thing that she realized was just a formality. People always ask, how you doing? And she said she found herself being heartbroken because she would literally sit and start telling folks how she was doing. But she didn't realize in the South, how are you doing just goes along with hello. The people are not really asking how you're doing. They didn't want to really sit there and, and, and find out what's going on with you. And she, she coming from Germany, she thought people were really asking her how she was doing. But she didn't understand Southern hospitality. That, that, that just goes along with hello. And most times people say, oh, I'm fine. I'm doing, just, I'm doing just well. And it's just a response, but not a real check-in. And brothers and sisters, we need to have genuine check-ins with ourselves. Because you can go through life being in the mountain, you can go through life being in the valley, you can go through life being in the cave, and no one really asks how you're doing. Or here we go, or we're not really honest with ourselves about how we're doing. We're constantly lying to ourselves, constantly coping with that hardship. Brothers and sisters, that's why Isaiah 44 says, every valley shall be exalted, every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked be made straight, and rough places plain. That means Isaiah, over 2,000 years ago, before this concept of the mountain, of the valley, in the cave came out, he already knew that, that God will exalt your valley experiences. 
God will lower those mountaintop experiences. God can lead you from the cave. But brothers and sisters, we have to be consistent with God. We have to be intentional with God. One of my favorite artists, Curtis Jackson, he said, sunny days wouldn't be special if it wasn't for rain. Joy wouldn't feel so good if it wasn't for pain. And brothers and sisters, we have to be honest because it's this fluctuating place that we're in that allows us to see the grace of God. You see, the reason we spend a lot of times lying to ourselves is because we're in survival mode. I realized it's a privilege to take time and acknowledge how you feel. It's a privilege to take time and express how you feel. Most of us are in survival mode, not wanting to appear weak. Most of us are in survival mode, and we only have time to focus on getting through, but not what happened to you. Hello, somebody. I said, some of us are only have that tunnel vision. I'm just trying to make it through. I can't deal with all the, the stuff that's happened to me because then I'll get weighed down. Then I'll be frustrated. I just got to have tunnel vision. And while that's good sometimes, brothers and sisters, we need help. Brothers and sisters, you can't do it by yourself. You got to know when to turn that off and when to turn that on. I told People during Bible study, sometimes you have to be like a freezer. Remember I said my mother used to clean out the freezer once a year, and I didn't know what she was doing. She would take everything out and pull out the the plug from the socket and let it thaw out, right? And the reason you let it thaw out is so that more things can get in there because of all the ice that is built up, but also to jumpstart the longevity of the freezer so that it can work properly. And sometimes you can store so much in that freezer. Sometimes you open and close it so much, the ice can, can, can build up. And it can be more ice than, than actual room to put stuff in. And brothers and sisters, sometimes we spend so much time where people put stuff on our spirits. People put stuff on our minds. And we never take time to defrost. We never take time to let loose. We never take time to decompress. And brothers and sisters, you'll never be able to fully let in the blessings of God, all that God has for you, all that God wants to do through you until you make some room in your spirit. Make some room in your heart and mind. Make some room. Take some time to defrost your mind, defrost your emotions, defrost your spirit. Amen. And some of the reason that we're acting crazy right now is because we ain't defrosted. Right. You, you, you filled up with all kind of stuff, and you just backed up emotionally, right? Emotionally constipated, amen? Come on, somebody. Here we go, here we go. But we're in the Gospel of Luke. We're in the Gospel of Luke. We're in the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 8, verse 43, going through 48. We find a woman with an issue of blood who is not okay. Here we go. I said, we find a woman with an issue of blood who is not okay. And she's not okay, but she's exhausted all resources, doing all she can to be okay. I said, we find a woman with an issue of blood. The text says she spent all the money. The text says she's gone to all the doctors. She's done all she can to be okay. And now she's Connecting to Jesus. Let me tell you about Luke, brothers and sisters. This is Luke's gospel. And remember I told you gospel means what? Good news. Let's say it again. Gospel means what? And the good news gospel is that Luke is the traveling companion of Paul. When Luke writes this gospel, he's the traveling companion of Paul. So therefore, he's writing this as a secondhand account of what really happened. Luke wasn't there with Jesus. This is a second generation, second uh, Christians, second generation of Christians that is writing this text. Amen. So he's getting a secondhand perspective of what's going on here in the book of Luke. Brothers and sisters, the book of Luke and Acts used to be together. They used to call it Luke Acts. Acts is actually the second volume of Luke. And where Luke ends, Acts begins. Right. And what Luke is trying to show is the power of the church. Luke is trying to show how the church has the power of the Holy Spirit granting the ability to liberate communities. 
that the Holy Spirit can grant healing, that the Holy Spirit can do all kind of things to transform your life. That is what Luke is advocating for. Luke is a Gentile. Many people don't know. Luke isn't a Jew. Luke is a common man. He's a Gentile, so he's writing to Gentiles. The reason that's important, because Matthew's gospel and some of the other gospels are focusing only on the Jews. That means you and I wouldn't have been able to receive salvation because we're not Jewish. But, but, but Luke's gospel comes in and he says the gospel good news is that the gospel message is good for everybody. Whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, a Gentile, whether you're a robber or a thief, whether you're a drug dealer, a stripper or a prostitute, the gospel is for everybody. That's what Luke is trying to assert. And brothers and sisters, Luke is not only a writer. Luke is also a physician, meaning Luke is also a doctor. And Luke is trying to show that although he is a doctor, he sees the importance of Jesus Christ. And Luke shows or begins Jesus's ministry by quoting the prophet Isaiah. Luke starts off in chapter 4, verse 18, with Jesus standing up in front of the Sanhedrin. And he opens up the scroll of Isaiah and he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor, because he has sent me to proclaim freedom to the prisoner, recovery of sight to the blind, to set those who are oppressed free. Luke got a good news gospel. Luke's gospel advocates for freedom. Luke's gospel advocates for liberation. Luke's gospel advocates for access to knowledge, power, and resources. Luke's gospel is for everybody. I ain't even got to the text yet. I'm just telling you about Luke. (laughs) Brothers and sisters, Luke is acknowledging that someone needs help. And with Jesus, you don't have to do it by yourself. I said, I'm I'm, I'm just on Luke right now. I ain't even got to the text yet. I said, what Luke is saying is that somebody out here reading this needs help. And Luke is advocating that you don't have to try to do it by yourself. Brothers and sisters, it is important to recognize the fact that Luke is a doctor writing about the miracle healing power of Jesus. Y'all don't miss that. Mr. Brown, don't miss this. Ethan, don't miss this. Luke is a doctor writing about the healing power of Jesus. What I'm telling you is Luke is a man of science writing about the mysticism of religion, right? And brothers and sisters, Luke Luke is someone that's been to medical school. Luke is someone that studied the body, human anatomy, and all these things. Luke is a practical man. In the beginning of chapter 1, he says, I have taken the eyewitness accounts, and I've studied, I've meditated, I've gotten all the information together to write this gospel to you, Theophilus. Right. Luke has been intentional, been meticulous about putting this gospel together. And this man of science, this man of practicality, this man of liking to see evidence of how things are going to work out is impacted by the power of God. What Luke knows us is there is a space for science and faith. What Luke is showing us is there is a space for prayer and health care. What Luke is showing us is that if a doctor says we need Jesus, we need to find the balance between faith and medicine, faith and counseling. Luke is showing us that, yes, it's good to believe in God, but you need a doctor. Luke is showing us that, yes, it's good to have a doctor, but you also need God. The power of Luke writing this gospel shows us that we need both brothers and sisters. Shows us that our faith is not only through us believing, but the work in which we do. Here we go. We need to take some notes from our Catholic brothers and sisters. You see, in the Catholic Church, they have something called sacraments, which they do, and they have one specific one called penance, right? That's when you've seen in movies where someone goes into that, like, little small room, and then the, the priest opens the, up the window, and it's like this veil between them, and, and, and the person starts saying, forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. 
And, and then the priest says, well, what, what are your sins, my brother or my sister? And the person just begins to just let it all out. Because the Catholic Church sees the importance of talking to someone. Sees the importance of letting some of what you've let build up inside of you out. Let me tell you what they said the importance of this confession does. They said the importance of confession gives you genuine self-knowledge so that you can be aware of what you're dealing with, so that you can be truthful about what you're facing. They said the importance of confession grants Christian humility because it shows you you can't do it by yourself, that you need to reach out to a higher power. They said the importance of confession corrects bad habits because after you keep going to this person admitting your sins at some point you're going to hear yourself repeating the same things over and over again and then you should get to the point well man maybe I need to stop doing this and realistically it's because people don't confess their sins because people keep it in that their mind gets real short and they keep doing the same things and don't even realize it but if you had somebody you was confessing that same stuff to you would get tired of telling you telling the same sins amen Somebody, somebody say amen. Here we go. They said the importance of confession clears the conscience, purifies the mind, purifies the spirit. It creates self-control and grace is increased in virtue of the sacrament itself. Brothers and sisters, they call this absolution. Somebody say absolution. And that's where you get forgiveness for your sins. And after you spilled all the beans, after you told all the negative things you've done, they don't go somewhere else and tell it. The priests hold that. They're sworn under oath not to tell anything that someone goes in there with. And do you know they've even been called in on juries to testify about things. And because they're under oath, they won't tell it. Some priests have even kept secrets unto death. Because of things they won't tell. Even if someone has killed somebody, even if someone has stolen money from the very church the priest works at. Can't tell it. That's different in the Baptist church. <laughs> Everybody business would just be out all in over the hood. We hadn't gotten to that point yet. But what I'm saying is that's why we need counseling. Brothers and sisters, that's why we need professionals to speak to. Brothers and sisters, they have this thing called absolution. And what that does is after you've made this confession, you need to be liberated of all that stuff spiritually. So then the priest prays a prayer and says, God, the father of mercies, through the death and resurrection of his son, reconciled the world to himself and sent the Holy Spirit among us for the forgiveness of sins through the ministry of the church. May God give you pardon and peace. And I absolve you from your sins in the name of the father, in the name of the son and in the name of the Holy Spirit. Brothers and sisters, that does something to your spirit. That does something to your mind because now you've been liberated from the stuff you've just been holding in. Brothers and sisters, that, if nothing else, should help you realize we need help. And we can't do it by ourselves. I want to be honest with you all. I had to get help myself. You know, we, as a church, are part of this organization called the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship, Right? We used to be under the Southern Baptist uh, faith group, but I switched that to the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship, and they've done a lot for me, and they've done a lot for our church, and that's the last mission group that I was um, with when I went to Puerto Rico. And they had this faith and finance kind of seminar where they assigned us uh, advisors and counselors, right? And so they assigned me this, this, this counselor, and I'm thinking the counselor is going to counsel me on my finances, so when the meeting comes, I'm ready with financial statements, with ideas of where I can invest my money, and we'll, we finna make some money to get, you know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm all excited. I'm like, what you finna tell me to help increase my credit score? I'm just all excited. And then I get on the phone with him, and he says, oh, I'm not here for that. I'm here to just talk to you about things you're going through in life. I said, I said I'm sorry, come again and say what? 
I, I said, I thought this was the counseling. I, I needed the counseling for the finances. I, I, I don't just need somebody to talk to, right? I don't have time just to be talk, talking to folks. If I want to talk to somebody, I call my daddy. Or the, you know, you know I, I, I call some, my mom or somebody. I, 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 I don't see the need to just be talking to somebody. And, and, and you know, this is, this is a organization where they're trying to get more black pastors. They're trying to get more people of color. So he's very much like, well, Charles, you know, um, if you can just set aside maybe an hour or so or 30 minutes, we can just talk through some things. Talk through some things. I don't have time for that. And, 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 he, and he's telling me, you know, Charles, the interesting part about this is that your emotional state impacts your finances. I said, really? He says, yes, because some people are compulsive spenders. Because of whatever they're dealing with in their life, they'll buy things to cope with whatever they're dealing with. Some people are hoarders, right? They'll hold on to the money and won't spend money on things they need to spend it on. Because they might have come from a place where they didn't have money and they're afraid to spend it because they never want to go back to that place again. Some people can't see people or actually have real relationships with significant others because they're looking at how much money they make because they're looking at how to elevate themselves through the money someone else has. Because of the families they grew up in where they didn't have money. So then he started relating to me, your emotions, your psychological well-being relates to finances. Hello, somebody. I said, well, maybe I need help. Because I can't do it by myself. And you know what, brothers and sisters, what, what was interesting about this is in the little counseling sessions, I resisted at first. I wasn't really talking like that. But after about maybe one or two of the sessions, I started realizing I was feeling good. I started realizing through talking to him, I didn't realize I had a lot of stuff built up on the inside. And you know what? He didn't give me answers for anything. He just redirected questions to help me come back to the conclusion about what I needed to do. So if I said, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm frustrated about what's going on. I'm trying to figure out, about, out how we're going to do this as a church, how we're going to move this way, how we're going to move that one. He said, well, let's talk about it and let's break it down. He says, well, 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 what have you done in the past? Well, I said, well, I did this and I did this. Well, who do you have to help you? Well, I said, well, I know I can get this person and that person. And he says, well, if you take that situation you did before and you get with the people you had last time, that'll at least be a little start. And I said, well, that makes sense. And then I realized that through breaking down big things and talking through them, you don't need somebody to give you all the answers. Sometimes you just need somebody to talk to. And brothers and sisters, it helps you realize you can't do it by yourself, that you might need a little help. Brothers and sisters, I didn't see the importance of planning like that, of talking like that, of working through that. I'm like, I got it. I can do it all on my own, you know, and, and that is something as a race of people, as a community, we need to stop because that's not of God. Because God can be sending you blessings. God can be sending you wise counsel, as the text says. But you can be rejecting it because you're so caught up on, it's always been me and mine by myself. I've always been in survival mode. I can't trust anybody because they've always betrayed me. I can't trust anybody because they've always used me. You got to get out of that. And you have to let God be your shield so you don't have to go around trying to protect yourself. Amen? Amen. Brothers and sisters, the text says, out of the mouth, the heart speaks. So therefore, if you want to know what's going on in your heart, if you want to know what's going on in your mind, check your conversation. Here we go. Or check the conversations people are comfortable with having around you. Hello. You get around some people, they'll just say all kind of negative, crazy, nasty stuff. And you should ask yourself, why is this person so comfortable talking like this around me? Or does that mean some of that spirit's also in me? What they say, birds of a feather flock together? What they say, tell me who your friends are and I'll tell you who you are? What they say, tell me who your friends are and I'll tell you who you're trying to be? Brothers and sisters, we have to be careful about who's feeding into our spirit and what we're feeding into other spirits. Right? It's not easy. But we in Luke. We in Luke, and we in Luke chapter 8. I know you're thinking, Pastor, all oh, that's good, but what that got to do with the woman? 
what that got to do with the woman with the blood? What that got to do with her touching Jesus? I, 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 I thank you for asking, Deacon Wallace. I'm going to make it plain. I'm going to make it plain. Watch this. I, I want you to notice something about the text here. Y- y'all still with me? Y'all still with me online? Hit the like button. Hit, hit the heart. I can't see it, but I'm going to go back and watch it. Y'all, y- y'all still with me? Okay, here we go. Watch this. The interesting part about this text, we started verse 43. It says, now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhaging for 12 years. For those of you all that know, don't know what that means, that's menstruation. She had been bleeding for 12 years, been on a period for 12 years, right? And although she had spent all she had on physicians, on doctors, no one could cure her. I wanted to hang out right there for a second. Pay attention to her situation and pay attention to the 12 years. And pay attention to the fact that it says no one could cure her. Mr. Brown, I thought about this text a lot. I thought about the fact that she was cured after the 12 years, after spending all her money, after all the pain. And you know what? Sister Childress, I had to ask myself, I said, I wonder if she had touched Jesus At the beginning of the 12 years, before she spent all the money, would she have still been healed? Brother Stewart, you ever thought about that? If she had touched Jesus before she went through losing all the money, before she went through the pain of 12 years of menstruation, before she went through the exclusion of being outcast by society for 12 years, because remember... You're deemed unclean by Levitical law if you're menstruating. They got a whole chapter on that. Men not supposed to sleep in the same wives as their bed. Actually, they're supposed to put their wife in a whole other house because they're ceremonially unclean. They can't even touch anything, can't even cook anything. They got to sit over in a space of the house until that is over. And she's been treated like that for 12 years. I wonder if before the 12 years she had touched Jesus, would she have received the healing? The reason why I ask this question is because this brings up an aspect of faith. Somebody say faith. Faith. You see, watch this. Some people use their faith as a reason not to seek help from doctors or counselors. But I call that shallow faith. I call that lazy faith. You see, using faith as an excuse not to do your part is lazy. Using faith as a reason to ask God to do something that you won't even do is not right. Brothers and sisters, when you expect God to deliver by upholding his part of the bargain, but you've not done your part, that's not right. Brothers and sisters, the book of James says, what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but do not have works? Can faith alone save you? So faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. Here we go. Stay with me. I said, so faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. So therefore, if you just blanketly throwing faith out, well, God will help me get through. God will heal me. But you ain't been to the doctor. You haven't gotten, gone to seek any help or counseling. How can you expect God to transform you when you won't even do what you need to do? Hello, somebody. I'm just trying to make it plain. So, brothers and sisters, we see here this woman with the issue of blood has something called active faith. Somebody say active faith. Active faith faith is a combination of effort and belief to yield results. I said active faith is the combination of effort and belief to yield results. This unnamed woman in the text, who they don't even give her a name. They just call her the lady with the issue of blood. You see what she does here? She takes faith, she takes works, touches Jesus, and receives healing. Y'all see that mathematical equation? Faith plus the works resulted in healing. Now, I'm not going to say just because every time you pray and have faith, everything's just going to work out. But at least if you start with faith. And if at least you make some efforts, we can at least believe that God will try to do something. Watch this. It's actually through you taking the active effort 
of showing God that I'm just not going to ask you. I'm going to move on what I've asked you to do, that you're showing faith. But realistically, when you're just acting, when you're just asking and not acting, you're not showing no faith. Right? You showing them that you're lazy. And how are you going to expect God to work harder for you than you work for yourself? Come on, somebody. Yes, there's grace. Yes, there's mercy. But I said, how are you going to uh, ask God to work harder for you than you work for yourself? Hello, somebody. I'm just trying to preach to you today. We need to have active faith. Active faith is the combination of effort and belief to yield results. So here we go, brothers and sisters, you'll never receive the emotional and physical healing, peace, or understanding you need having faith without works. So our works and our faith together is what yields the results. Brothers and sisters, Luke 8 shows us the physical manifestation of the healing through faith in action. Let me say that again. I said this story with the issue of blood is the physical manifestation of what happens when we put faith into action. Brothers and sisters, this shows us that you can have help and that you don't have to do it by yourself. You have to be open to receiving it. You see, brothers and sisters, when we get to verse 44, it says she came up behind him and touched the fringe of his clothes and immediately her hemorrhaging stopped. Her bleeding stopped. And Jesus asked, who touched me? Somebody say, who touched me? Somebody say, who touched me? When all denied it, Peter said, master, the crowd surrounding you and pressing in on you. But Jesus said, someone touched me. I noticed that power had gone out of me. Y'all, I'm about to wrap it up. I got to hang out right here. I got to hang out right here. Touching Jesus. Somebody say that with me, touching Jesus. Sometimes you got to touch on Jesus. Hey, hello, hello, somebody. Sometimes you got to reach out and touch Jesus. Now, 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 the interesting part about this, there's two types of touching that we can look at with Jesus, right? Now, she physically touched him, but she also emotionally and spiritually touched him. I said she physically touched him. But she emotionally and spiritually touched him. The reason I asked that question earlier, Brother Stewart, about if she would have been healed prior to the 12 years versus after the 12 years is that if she had been healed prior, if she had touched him prior to the 12 years, I don't think she would have touched Jesus with all the pain. I don't think she would have touched Jesus with all the hurt. I don't think she would have touched Jesus with all the disappointment. I don't think she would have touched Jesus with all the anger. And brothers and sisters, sometimes we're not touching Jesus because we ain't spent time to tarry with him. Sometimes we're not touching Jesus because we ain't surrendered our emotions, because we haven't surrendered our brain. We're still lying to ourselves and not being truthful with God. And if you want to have a true encounter with God, you got to touch Jesus. You see, You see, brothers and sisters, I I had to switch up the skating rink I was going to. Y'all know I like to skate on Sundays. And I I was going to to cascade and stuff. But, you know, I'm I'm 30 years old now. And uh, the music that they're listening to these days, it just don't, it don't touch me the same way. It it, it really really don't touch me, Mr. Brown, the same way. I I mean, I I, I get it, Ethan. I get it. You know, the new artists, they're coming out. But I, I can't understand the music the same way. And I used to think I'd never say that. Remember when, remember when Kurt Franklin came out and, and the older generation was just, just, just so hard on Kurt Franklin. And I just didn't understand. I, I thought I would never say that when I got older. But now I'm in the skating rink and I'm like, what is this? And, and everybody else that's, that's in their 18, 20, you know, they just, uh, you know, moving and, you know, they, 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 really, you know, they really into it, doing all the little dances. And I'm like, I, I can't, it's not touching me. So I had to switch my skating rink. And go to the skating rink where they play music for the 30 and up crew. <laughs> right, right. I had to get, you, you, you know, I, now I'm in the 30 and up crew. And, and, and brothers and sisters, it, 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 you know, they, 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 they playing the OJs in there. I know that's even before my generation, but it's something about how it touches me. They're in there playing Astrid and Simpson, brothers and sisters. They're in there playing Ron Isaac. Here we go. They're in there playing uh, uh, Lauren Hill, yeah. Drew Hill, Tyrese. 
You know what I'm saying? They're in there playing those old classics, and now I can groove. Now I can move because now the music touches me. And brothers and sisters, I feel that same way about our church music. All this hill song stuff, this, this, this new style of music, it's good. It's still praising the Lord, and that's great. But I went to a church, they had guitars. One time they had, you know, the drum, they had all that stuff, and they were up there just rocking out. And everybody's waving their hands and feeling, I'm looking around, Lord, there's something wrong with me. Because, <laughs> Lord, I, I, ain't feeling, I ain't feeling none of this, Lord. I said, Lord, where's the organ? I'm looking, trying to find it. <laughs> Lord, ain't no Leslie, ain't no organ nowhere. I just, you know, it, it was a different church. It wasn't, you know, it, was, it wasn't one of our churches. And I, and I was trying to get in the spirit, but it just didn't touch me, brothers and sisters. And, it, and it's something about when you hear an old hymn. It's something about when you hear, Father, I stretch my hands to thee, no other help I know. Right? It's something about when you hear, what a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and grief to bear. What a privilege it is to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what faith we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear, all because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Have you found a friend so faithful? Be there trouble anywhere. You should never get discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Brothers and sisters, it's something about them old songs where folks were singing and folks was writing from the pain of the years they had gone through, from the hurt of believing in God and not being delivered like they thought they should have been, but then also being delivered in the ways they finally felt they could be. Brothers and sisters, it's something about the old time religion. And what I assert to you, what I'm telling you, is that God wants us to touch him. Brother C.L. Franklin would say, y'all don't hear me. Y'all not listening to me. He, so, 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 sometimes you just need something that touches you in a way that you ain't been touched before. And I submit to you that at this point in time in our lives, we need to make sure we're touching God. We need to make sure we have a relationship with God. We need to make sure we're surrendering the pain to God. Because you can have help. And you don't have to do it by yourself. Brothers and sisters, we all need help. Adam needed help, so God created Eve. We all need help. Moses got help when his father Jethro had him appoint judges over the tribe. We all need help. David got help in his friendship with Jonathan. We all need help. Naomi got help when Ruth said to your people, when Ruth said to Naomi, your people will be my people and your God, my God. We all need help. Elijah got help when he found Elisha. We all need help. Joshua and the spies got help from the prostitute Rahab. We all need help. Paul got help when he connected with Barnabas and Silas. We all need help. Jesus got help even with the disciples. Brothers and sisters, we all need help. And you need help, so go get a doctor. You need help, so go get some counseling. Brothers and sisters, if Dr. Luke could speak to you today, Dr. Luke would say, go and get some help. Brothers and sisters, if the woman with the issue of blood could speak to you today, she'd say, go on and get you some help. Brothers and sisters, if Jesus walked through these doors right now, He'd look at some of y'all and say, yes, you can pray and talk to me, but you need to go on and get you some help. You see, if you don't remember anything else from this sermon, I want you to walk away knowing that it's okay to seek help, seek help and to seek God. It's okay to seek help, but it's not okay to disregard help and solely rely on God. It's not okay to solely rely on help and then disregard God. Brothers and sisters, at some point we got to admit we're not okay. At some point we got to admit we need to talk to somebody. At some point we need to admit we need help. Amen? Amen and amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, there's some people that's watching. There's some people that may be in this sanctuary that are afraid to ask for help. They're afraid to ask for help because for so long they've been relying on the lie. For so long they've been pacifying themselves with things, pacifying themselves with pleasures, pacifying themselves with positions and titles. 
pacifying themselves with money, pacifying themselves with everything but you because they don't want to face the truth. But Lord, your word tells us that we will know the truth and the truth will make us free. And we come to you today on this Sunday morning asking to be liberated so that we can be made free, so that we can be healed and be made whole. Lord, it's not easy to live in this life. And we need you every minute, every second, every hour. And I pray that somebody that's looking for a relationship with you will find it in this moment. will find it today and get closer to you through using the help you bring. In your son Jesus' name, I pray we pray. Amen. At this time, I'm extending an invitation. If there's anyone in the sanctuary that wants to give their life to Christ, you can come up at this time. If there's anyone in the sanctuary or watching online that wants to give their life to Christ. I'm sending you a personal invitation. I'm sending you a friend request on behalf of God. And what you can do, you can let that friend request sit in your inbox. You can just look at it. Or you can respond to that request and accept it. And brothers and sisters, I ask that at this time, you take the time to ask yourself, are you okay? Ask yourself, are you in a valley? Are you in the cave or are you on the mountaintop? Ask yourself these questions so that no matter where you are, you'll come to the conclusion that you need God. And a relationship with God will help you navigate the mountaintop, the valley, or the cave. So brothers and sisters, at this time, if you are struggling with that relationship or want to have more out of life, I extend this invitation to you. And all you have to do is give your whole life, not part of your life, not a piece of it, but your whole heart and mind to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. First, you must confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, then believe it in your heart. And the confessing with your mouth is the easy part, but the believing in your heart is a daily process. So here at New Morning Light, we pride ourselves on discipleship. And we pride ourselves on being a family, a church family, in which you can connect with and be a part of. So if you'd like to connect with us, you can reach out to us on our social media platforms. You can send me an email at Reverend Charles at newmorninglight.org. Or you can send us a DM on our Facebook page and we'll respond to that and we'll get you connected. But we want to extend this invitation to you. For those that are watching and those that are in the sanctuary. Seeing none in the sanctuary, I presume that all of us have a good and solid relationship with God. But I still want to remind you, even though you know God, remember you need help. Remember you can go get a doctor. Remember you can go talk to a counselor. And you can also pray as well. And God will often speak to you through the very people that he puts in your life. You can't just keep relying on God just to come down and do things and fix things for you. No, no, no. He sends people. Sometimes you're his hand, you're his feet, but you have to be a willing vessel. Amen.